Hi friends, Narrator Austin here. Can you believe we're already getting to the last chapter of book one in the series, Survivors of the Dark Rebellion? And now today's last chapter is going to bring us right through through the life of David, and we'll be ready to move on to book two afterwards. So stay tuned at the end of this video, after the end credits, and the information on our free book ministry, so you can get a sneak peek on the next book we're going to be going into, which is Exile of the Chosen. All right, I'll see you after today's chapter is done. My name is Mark, a recording angel. I've been observing this earth since the dawn of creation. The Most High has asked me to share my recordings with you. The following are my records of earth's earliest patriarchs and prophets, collected in this book. Survivors of the Dark Rebellion, God's Heroes from Adam to David. If today's recording contains situations which might be uncomfortable for younger listeners, I will mark the video with the words parental guidance recommended. Chapter 11, Jared. Jared halted hesitantly at the edge of the circle of young people. Welcome to the School of the Prophets, a friendly voice said. You may stand here with Ethan and do what he does until our class is finished for today. Nodding. Jared glanced shyly at Ethan. The other boy grinned back. Tall and lanky, with unruly, curly black hair that would not stay under his head covering, he looked friendly. Jared felt relieved. Going to be a student in one of the schools of the prophets had sounded exciting when his father had first mentioned it at home, but the closer they came to Rama, the smaller and less brave he felt. As his father left, Jared could hardly keep from running after him and begging to go home to Nob. Come with me. Ethan instructed as soon as class finished. I'll show you where we sleep and where you can put your things. Jared looked down at his satchel. His possessions consisted of an extra outer robe and a few loaves of bread that his mother had tucked into the bag as he was leaving. And his mantle. He was especially proud of his mantle. The tassels on the corners had the blue thread in them to remind him of the covenant between God and his people. Was that the prophet Samuel teaching the class we were just in? He asked Ethan. The other boy laughed. Nay, Sam is a really old man. It would wear him out to teach us every day. We study the things he plans for us, but he has some specially trained Levites to do the actual teaching. You'll get to meet him, though. He travels between the two schools and speaks with us sometimes. What does the prophet give you to study? We must memorize the sacred texts. Plus, he has some guidelines for managing the kingdom. My grandfather says he really wrote them for King Saul back when he was a new king, but Saul never used them. Why not? Jared asked. Well, for one thing, at least according to Grandfather, Saul felt that since he was a king, he shouldn't have to accept instructions from anybody. Even God's prophet? Jared said incredulously. Yeah, I guess not. Samuel started the schools of the prophets so that we'd be educated and then return to our hometowns and teach others how God wanted our country to be run and how our people should live. But what kinds of things do we learn? Jared continued. Yeah, besides having to learn to read and write, we study music and law and sacred history. I've heard that the prophet's writing a book of sacred history now, too. Do you think we'll get to read it? Jared, still full of questions, inquired. <laughs> I, I'm sure we'll have to read it if he finishes it before we leave school. Ethan laughed. Oh, I can't wait to meet Samuel. I've heard so much about him. Oh, I don't let him fool you, Ethan whispered. He looks like a frail little old man, but he isn't. When he's angry, he fixes those flashing eyes on you. He's really frightening. Even King Saul wilts under his fiery gaze. After glancing around quickly, Ethan then added under his breath, And my father says that he once chopped a king's head off. Jared's eyes widened. I shook my head. I just hate it when humans tell a little bit of a story and don't include enough information. It always makes God or his prophets look harsh when there's so much more involved. I remember that day clearly. Saul had led his armies against the Amalekites. God had told him to kill them all and not to bring back prisoners or booty. Instead, Saul returned with King Agag in chains, and lots of animals, women, and other spoil from the Amalekites. Samuel went to where Saul had Agag kneeling in chains and confronted Saul's disobedience. The king protested that he had brought back all the sheep from the Amalekite camp for extra sacrifices to God. The Almighty One didn't believe it, and neither did Samuel. He strode over to King Agag and cut his head off, shocking everyone present into silence. To Saul, it had seemed a minor thing, especially since he just wanted to do things his own way. 
It added to his prestige to show off the enemy king in chains, and it made him popular with his army to let them take booty home. He was more interested in power and popularity than obeying God. I was glad that Samuel was recording Israel's history so that someday, perhaps, people would understand how loving the Mighty One really is, and how wise and ultimately merciful even his sternest instructions really are. In the meantime, I guess, as always, humans just have to trust him. Jared settled in well at the school. The boy enjoyed his friendship with Ethan and found adjusting much easier with someone to help him. He enjoyed all of his classes and was used to hard work. His favorite class was music. Not only did they perform the old songs used for generations by the followers of God, but they were also learning new contemporary music, including some of the songs that the newest court musician had just composed. His name was David. Do you know anything about this, David? Jared asked Ethan one day. His friend laughed. I wish you, I know everything. Jared believed that it was probably true. Ethan seemed to be a wealth of information, and his father seemed to have all kinds of connections. As a result, Ethan knew all the latest rumors circulating through the kingdom. So, what's he like? Jared insisted. Oh, well, he's the youngest son in his family, so he's never been very important. He spent most of his time herding sheep. His older brothers are important, though. They're soldiers in Saul's army. Yeah, yeah, but, but tell me about David. Well... I guess that all the time he spent sitting out there watching the sheep, he used to compose music. A uh, harpist. Uh, he'd sing his psalms and prepare music for them, and apparently he's found King Saul to be a more appreciative audience than the woolly ones he started out with. Jared laughed. He could just picture in his mind David surrounded by sheep listening to his concert. Well, I really like his hymns, Jared continued. That one we were learning yesterday is so beautiful. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the sky that his hands created them. Oh, I just love the words. Last night I looked up at the stars, and they do remind us of God's glory. David is right. Yeah, I like the music better. No, no, Jared protested. It's the words. That part about the law of the Lord being perfect and giving us strength and that we can trust them, it's beautiful. Ethan shrugged. He was more interested in sharing information about David than in singing his songs. I think David is one of the wisest people alive, Jared continued. Yeah, why do you say that? Well, look at the words of the sob that he wrote to comfort the king. When the king gets in such a dark mood, I just don't see how he could be discouraged after he listened to the words of David's sob. Eh, hey, what one was that? I, I guess I wasn't paying attention. Jared shook his head. How could Ethan have missed it? I'll sing it to you. And he sang. Lord, the king is filled with joy because you are strong. How great is his joy because you help him win his battles. You have given him what his heart longed for. You haven't kept back from him what his lips asked for. Hey, you really think that makes the king happy? I, I hear he has a love-hate relationship with the Lord. He does? Jared asked in surprise. Eh, well, that's what my father says. Saul likes to be in charge. And every once in a while he acts as if being the king allows him to make his own decisions instead of waiting to see what the Lord tells him to do through Samuel, especially if the prophet keeps him waiting. Jared shook his head. Well, I still like the song. Remember the part that says that the king trusts in the Lord, the faithful love of the Most High will keep him secure? His friend laughed. Well, <laughs> and maybe that's why the king isn't secure, because he doesn't trust in the Lord that much. Well, I still think it's a wonderful psalm, and if I was a king and feeling depressed, I would find it very comforting. And you know what I think? Ethan offered. I think that if Saul doesn't really trust in the Lord, and David keeps singing to him about him, one of these days the king is going to just throw something at him. I can't believe that'll ever happen. Jared scoffed. Hey, it's just my guess. You never know. Saul has a pretty hot temper. Really? Yeah, oh yeah. Ethan insisted. Yeah, he throws things when he's mad. My father said so. Jared shook his head in puzzlement. Having never lived near the court, he had always viewed King Saul with awe, bordering on reverence. It was hard to imagine him as a person with a temper and good days and bad days like everyone else. It worries me that Saul doesn't follow God with his whole heart. Ethan gave him a sharp look. Well, it's always been that when we followed God and our leaders followed God, we did well. And when our leaders didn't follow God, terrible things happened. Yeah, hey, perhaps... Ethan said slowly, if enough of us in Israel are loyal to God, God will bless Israel, even if our king is not what we wish he was. Jared had a faraway look in his eye. It was something he needed to think about.
The other boys at the School of the Prophets referred to Jared and Ethan as why and who. Ethan was who, always full of the latest gossip. He knew who was doing what and with whom and seemed to have sources everywhere. They named Jared why because he was always asking questions. And today was no different. Why? He asked the priest who was instructing them. Are we learning so much about the sanctuary and Moses' rules for that when we don't have one? What happened to the wilderness sanctuary we've been studying about? The priest stroked his beard for a moment as he tried to think of the most diplomatic way to phrase his answer. It happened only a few years ago, he said finally. The high priest then was Eli. He raised the prophet Samuel. Was Samuel his son? The priest shook his head. No, no, Samuel was the son of a Levite named Elkanah and a woman named Hannah. Uh, since the woman had been barren for many years, and Samuel was an answer from God to her prayers for a child, she dedicated him to the Lord. His mother brought him to the sanctuary as soon as he was weaned, and then Eli took charge of him. That doesn't explain what happened to the sanctuary, though, Jared observed. Oh, oh yes, the sanctuary, the priest said, getting back to the point. We were already at war with the Philistines. Uh, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, thought that if we carried the Ark of the Covenant into battle, as other nations do their symbols of their gods, our god would fight on our side. Did they ask God's permission first? Jared questioned. Uh, no, they had a history of treating God and his things with disrespect. This was just one incident of many. They took the Ark into battle. At first it frightened the Philistines, but unfortunately, once they recovered from their fear, they <laughs> slaughtered us. Uh, well, not all of us, the priest said, beginning to shift from one foot into the other, obviously uncomfortable. Hophni and Phinehas both perished, and the Philistines captured the Ark. They swarmed back to Shiloh and destroyed the sanctuary. That's why we don't have one now. So all the stuff we studied about the Day of Atonement and all those other things can't happen right now, Jared observed. Half is a question, half is a statement to himself. Yes, yes, uh, but, but the Ark is still with us. Uh, in Nob, where you come from, we still offer sacrifices to the Lord. But you're right, we don't really have a full-fledged sanctuary right now. Jared's forehead wrinkled. But why? why? Why haven't we done something about it? Saul's our king. Why isn't he doing something about it? The priest now started to stutter. Well, uh, well, uh, you see, uh, Saul, uh, uh, Saul may not care uh, about that right, right, right now. Uh, he, he has other things to think about. Uh, fighting the Philistines. Running the country. But surely worshipping God properly would be more important than battling the Philistines or anything else. It's enough questions for today, interrupted an elderly priest who had just arrived. We need to get on with other things. Let's move on to a music lesson. The boy frowned. The student, sitting behind him, snickered. <laughs> Aren't you going to ask why we're going to do a music lesson? You ask why for everything else. Blushing, Jared said nothing. Jared had been at the School of the Prophets almost a year when his father showed up one day. I'm sorry, Jared, he said. I know that you really enjoy school, and I believe that's where God wants you to be, but I need you to help me. What's happening? He asked, is anything wrong with mother? Your mother's fine, his father said, smiling gently. The Philistines have been raiding again. Yes, we're always at war with the Philistines. Well, it's a big battle, and we're all going, and I need you to come too. Jared understood. Several of the other boys were leaving the schools of the prophets to join the battle too. Although his father had taught him a few military skills, Jared had never been in a real battle. Now he would really see the Philistines. He hoped he would act bravely. It was hard saying goodbye to his friend Ethan and the others, but it was too exciting to grieve over for long. When they reached the battle site, Jared's father quickly found the rest of his family. They had a quick lunch and then went out to the edge of the valley. The Israelites had lined up on one side, the Philistines on the other. Both armies waited for the other to make the first move. Suddenly Jared noticed a stirring on the Philistine side. The boy and his friends jostled each other, trying to see what was going on. A huge man strode out into the center of the valley. Young men, men of Israel! Of Israel. He shouted, There's, There's no, no point, point in all in of us all getting, getting killed. killed. I'm Goliath, Goliath of God. I'll represent, I'll represent the Philistines. Philistines. Send me your, your best soldier, soldier and we'll fight. fight. Whichever, Whichever one of us wins, the other side, side will submit. submit. I know I none of you are in the mood for dying today anyways. You Israelites are all cowards. Cowards? Jared bristled at the idea. As Goliath continued talking, his insults and taunts became more and more offensive. How can he say those things? 
Jared protested. That's blasphemy. Are we just going to stand here and let him talk like that? I am, his father replied. How about you? But, but he's blaspheming our God. Yes, but what are we going to do about it? You want to fight anybody that size? I'll bet his spear weighs as much as you do. His son stared for a moment. Yes, it, it probably does. Well, his father continued. Never mind. I'll be quiet, Lau. Jared stared at his feet. He couldn't understand why no one would battle the Philistine, yet he was afraid to. Goliath paced up and down the valley, heaping insult upon insult on the armies of Israel, and particularly their god. Suddenly, a young man walked from the Israelite side toward the Philistine battle line. He's not very big either, Jared pointed out to his father. Nope, and we'll just stand here and watch him get slaughtered. Although Jared felt sick to his stomach, he couldn't tear his eyes away from the scene. The smaller man approached the giant, unafraid. Come, Come here, little, little man. man, Goliath boomed. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna feed you to the birds. No, 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 you're not, you're not. the younger man shouted in reply. You come you to come me to with, me a, with sword a sword and a spear, and a spear but, but I, come I come to you come in the name, in of, the name of the Lord. Lord. He pulled something from his small skin satchel and tucked it into his sling. Ugh, what do you oh, think, think I am? am? The giant bellowed. A dog? Will you throw rocks at me? You think I'll run home with me tail between my legs because you hurled a rock or two? The younger man didn't answer, but released the stone through the air. It hit the giant right in the forehead. He dropped to the ground. The Israelite ran forward, grabbed the huge sword from the giant, and with one blow chopped his head off. Seizing it by the hair, he held it high. The armies of Israel roared. The Philistines scattered. Jared ran with the rest of the army after them, picking up the weapons they dropped along the way. That night around the campfire, everyone was too excited to sleep. Who was that? Jared asked someone. Oh, that was David, son of Jesse. He was a shepherd until last year. Since then he's been at court as Saul's musician. The musician? The one who writes those sobs? The one that, that wrote the hymn about... Yeah, yeah, that's him said one of the other men. Oh. Jared remembered a rumor that Ethan had passed along, something about the prophet Samuel anointing a new king. Could this David be the same one? Surely Samuel wouldn't anoint someone else as king while the current one was still on the throne. The boy frowned. Why would Samuel do that? Could it be that the prophet was feeling old and wanted to anoint the next king before he died? No, that couldn't be. Saul had a son who was a great war hero. Everyone knew that Prince Jonathan was going to be the next king. Jared shook his head. Some things were too hard to figure out. Jared and his father went home to Nob after the battle. He enjoyed telling others about the huge giant and the young soldier who had killed him without any armor or weapons of his own, except for a shepherd's sling. At first, rejoicing spread all through the land, and the women sang everywhere about the new hero David. One tune compared David with King Saul. The chorus went, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Jared wondered how that would go over with King Saul. From the stories Ethan had told him, it sounded as if the king did not tolerate the idea of a rival. The boy hoped that David would be safe. It wasn't long before stories began filtering out from Gibeah that David's life was in danger. In fact, Saul was trying to kill him. One day, Jared was just heading back toward his home with a load of firewood when he saw someone approaching the town. He had to take a second look to be sure. But it was David. He dropped the firewood and ran toward him. We're honored you've come to our town, he said. The visitor smiled nervously. I, uh, th I thank you, young man, he said. I'm honored to meet you. My name is David. I've come to see the priest of Himalek. I need him to ask the Lord what I should do next. Jared nodded. Ahimelech was high priest, even if Israel no longer had Moses' tabernacle. He had set up a tent for the ark and still fixed the weekly showbread and offered sacrifices, praying for the sins of his people. I'll show you where he lives, Jared offered. Come with me. The boy hung around, knowing that he really needed to get back to his firewood, but not wanting to miss any excitement. Because David talked quietly with Ahimelech, Jared couldn't hear a thing, only the rising and falling of their voices. But he could sense that the high priest seemed afraid. Then David said, Thank you so much. Also, do you have any bread? My men and I are hungry. No, Ahimelech said after a pause. Only show bread. 
But it's for the Lord, the high priest protested. Only men who have not touched women can eat that. It's really an emergency, David insisted. My men are starving. And they are pure. Uh, when we're facing battles and danger, we commit ourselves to the Lord, and none of us have seen our wives for days. At last Ahimelech gave David the bread. God will bless you for this, his visitor said. The high priest said nothing. One more thing. Do you have a sword? One, Ahimelech answered. I have the sword from the giant you killed. He disappeared into a tent and returned with something wrapped up in a cloth. Removing the cloth, he revealed an enormous sword, then handed it to David. God bless you and protect you, he said. And now you must go. As Jared slowly returned to his abandoned firewood, he noticed Doeg the Edomite. The boy frowned. He didn't know Saul's chief of shepherds very well, but Ethan had told him not to trust him. Jared shook his head. Ethan was always full of gossip. Maybe his friend just didn't like him because he was an Edomite. Still, the boy had a funny feeling in the pit of his stomach. Jared had become friends with Abiathar, another former student at the School of the Prophets, though he had been there some time before Jared had attended. The young man was also Ahimelech's son. He and Abiathar were together the afternoon that Saul and his men galloped into town. They all bowed in awe. Why would the king of Israel choose to come to a small town like Nob? Had he come to consult the high priest? By this time, everyone knew that the king paid very little heed to what God or his priest thought, so why was he here now? But Jared was too busy being scared to ask the question out loud. We we need to hide, Abiathar, he whispered. Oh, but I want to see what the king is here for, his friend protested. Something bad is going to happen, I know it. Jared glanced around him. His eyes rested on Doeg, the Edomite, now riding just a few paces behind the king. Follow me, the boy insisted. I'll, I'll tell you what I think is going to happen. As the king and his men thundered past and headed for Ahimelech's home, Jared and Abiathar fled in the other direction. They ran until they were out of breath. In a gully south of town, they hid in a little cave they had once played in. <sighs> it's Doeg, Jared said. The Edomite. He was here the day David was here. Uh, I heard that the king and David are not getting along. I think Saul is after him. And I believe something bad is going to happen here. I I just don't trust him. Abiathar laughed. <laughs> Jared, you have the wildest imagination. I'm going back. You brought me out here just because you had a bad feeling? I didn't have a bad feeling. I just know it. Come on, we're going to miss all the excitement. The one day the king comes to town, you drag me off to a cave because you have a bad feeling. Abiathar turned on his heel and headed back toward town. Jared sat down and rested his head on his knees. Maybe he was being stupid. It was all Ethan's fault. He sat trying to figure it out. Why? Why? His questions kept going round and round inside his head. Would the Lord explain things to him? Uh, are you there? He whispered in the darkness of the cave. God of Abraham, if you're listening to me, and Samuel taught us that you're always listening... Please help me to understand. I, I just can't go back there right now. The boy received no answer, but he soon felt a little more peaceful. Lulled by the silence of the cave, he fell asleep. Jared! Jared, wake up! He startled awake. Where was he? Oh, yes, the cave. What's the matter? He asked. It was Abiathar, shaking and sobbing. What happened? What's wrong? It was a few moments before his friend could answer. <laughs> Jared, you were right. It's horrible. It's just horrible. They're all dead. Who's dead? I didn't get back there in time, so I saw some of this from a little distance. I guess Saul was looking for David. He knew my father, Ahimelech, helped David. As I got closer, I could hear him protesting that, that while he had helped David and given him food and a sword, David was a loyal subject, just like anyone else, loyal to Saul. The king wouldn't hear of it. and he commanded one of his men to kill my father. That's when I hid. I'm ashamed. The rest of the priests came out and stood with Ahimelech. All of them. Uh, all of them? Gerald echoed. E even my father? Abiathar nodded. 
The soldier refused to kill a priest of God. Saul so went down the line. None of the soldiers would do it, but Doeg the Edomite. Doeg? I knew it. Jared exploded. He, he killed your father? Or is it that? <laughs> Abiathar sobbed. He killed everyone. Everyone? Jared repeated. Everyone? Uh, our, our fathers? Everyone? More than that, Abiathar continued. They went through the town. They killed the women and the babies and the children. Even the flocks. He murdered everyone. Jared was stunned. If I hadn't felt that something was wrong, I, I wouldn't have come to hide in the cave, he said slowly. Abiathar nodded. Yeah, and if you hadn't dragged me off here, I wouldn't have gotten there late and had another chance to hide. Well, what do we do now? Jared asked. We have no family. What will we do? Well, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't feel loyal to King Saul anymore. <laughs> God's prophet might have anointed him king. But Saul turned his back on God, and I wanted to turn my back on him. His feelings all confused, Jerry remained silent. He didn't feel as if he could even stand, much less think. Uh, I know where David is, Abiathar announced. You do? Yeah. I am elected, too. He, he just didn't tell. I'm going to join him. While I'm not a soldier, I, he may need a Levite or two around. I have one of the ephods. Uh, at least we can sing his songs for him. Jared thought for a moment, then declared, uh, I'm with you. Jared and Abiathar traveled by night, hiding in fear from everyone they encountered. But no one was looking for the two young men. You know, Abiathar said one day, I think my father guessed something like this might happen. What makes you think that? It was one of Samuel's first prophecies to Eli. God told him that none of our family were going to live to be old men. Jared considered it, then nodded. Hophni and Phinehas died in battle. Well, that was probably a good thing for all of Israel. They were terrible. Jared sighed. They even had Egyptian names. Hophni means tadpole. And uh, I'm told Phineas means Nubian, but there wasn't anything Nubian about it. Yes, I wonder why Eli gave them foreign names when he was a priest of God, the high priest even. So what were you saying about Eli's family? Well, my father was the last one of Eli's relatives. Now they're all dead, except for me. But Eli was a Levite, were all his relatives. Right, said Abiathar, but of his close family, I'm the last one. Jared shook his head. So God knew and told Samuel way back then that this was going to happen? Yeah. Somehow it makes me feel a little better. The God of Israel knew what was going to happen, even down to the last relatives of Eli, and told Samuel so long ago. I think we can trust the other things he told the prophet. I think if we follow him with all our hearts and do all the things we learned in Samuel's school of the prophets, I think he'll take care of us. Then Jared frowned again. But what about you a and Saul? What about us? Abiathar said bitterly. Well, does the prophecy apply to you too? And Ethan told me that Samuel anointed someone to be a new king when Saul dies. Abiathar sighed. I don't know. I'll just have to trust God. And, and, and who do you think will be the new king? I believe it will be David. Rumor has it that it happened before David went to court to be the musician for Saul and way before his encounter with Goliath. Well, you and I are ready to follow him anyway, Abiathar said. But it makes sense that he might be the one chosen by God. But part of it I don't understand, Jared continued. If Saul dies, Jonathan will be king. I don't see how David could become king without... Overthrowing Saul, Abiathar suggested. Perhaps, but that doesn't seem to be God's way of doing things. The priest's son shook his head. No, but sometimes God fights our battles for us. Remember all the stories about how God went ahead of our people as we entered Canaan? and sometimes drove people out with hornets, and sometimes knocked their walls down without us doing a thing. Maybe God knows something we don't know about how Saul is going to end up. I don't know, 
but for now, I'm going to join David. And like you, I'm going to have to trust God. I, after all, he seems to understand what's going on. I, I certainly don't. I don't either, Abiathar sighed. But one thing I know, in this whole crazy conflict, we can always trust him. I smiled. Here were two of the wisest humans on their little planet. Trusting the Mighty One was the only thing they could do in such confusing times. Times when all their rules about worship couldn't be followed because their sanctuary had been partially destroyed. No matter how confused the survivors of this dark conflict might become, they could always trust the Mighty One. Epilogue Jared and Abiathar joined David and his band of friends at Kiaila. Life wasn't easy, but because they had no family to return to, it was their best option. They remained loyal to God and to David, though Saul and his armies hunted and chased them. It was only two years later that Saul and his son Jonathan died fighting the Philistines. All three of Saul's sons perished that day. And just as the prophet Samuel had anointed him so many years before, David became the king of Israel. Jared became a priest and taught in one of the schools of the prophets that Samuel had started, and Abiathar became high priest of Israel. David was loyal to the Mighty One. He had the Ark of the Covenant brought from the home where it had sat idle all those years. They put together a sanctuary for it in Jerusalem. And David began the plans for building the greatest building project anyone could ever imagine, a huge temple to the Almighty. His son Solomon would actually construct it. Though the conflict continued, the survivors were always those who stayed loyal and trusted the Mighty One. This broadcast has come from the book Survivors of the Dark Rebellion by Sally Pearson Dillon with permission from the Review and Herald Publishing Association. This book and the rest of the series, War of the Ages, can be purchased by going to www.adventistbookcenter.com or by calling 1-800-765-6955. I'm your narrator, Austin Backus, and this audio project is a gift to you from my free Christian book ministry, RXF 1888. Please visit our website, www.rxf1888.com, to request free Christian books for both kids and adults. And join us here again for more stories from Mark the Recording Angel. Hello again, friends. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that wrap-up to book one, but you realize we're only halfway through the Old Testament, so next we'll be moving into book two in this series called Exile of the Chosen. And in this book, we're going to be going through lots of famous Old Testament stories, stories of prophets like Elijah, stories of kings like Josiah, queens like Esther, and even stories of children like that little girl who was Naaman's servant girl, and remember she told him to where he could go to get healed from his leprosy? Let's learn about her life too. Wouldn't you enjoy that? So, I hope you'll tune in to the next playlist where we start this book next week and that you'll stay through all the way until the end of the whole series. I can't wait to have you join me again. And by the way, if you really enjoyed this David chapter that we had today, which really only had kind of a little mention of some of David's adventures, I think you would enjoy seeing a particular production of the life of David done in a musical form by the Christian group at Holy Land Experience. I have a video of it saved on my YouTube page. So if you go onto my YouTube page, look for the playlist called Holy Land Experience, and you'll find the life of David done there. It's an amazing, amazing performance. It's got beautiful songs that are some of the favorite ones in our home. So I think you'll enjoy that too. All right, friends, we'll see you next week as we keep on going on this adventure together. God bless you. Bye.